And good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to Somnimed's second uh, webinar in the Sleep Partners series. It is 6 p.m. here in Dallas, and I want to welcome both Dr. Kent Smith and Mike Ring to the program. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a great time today. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a an explanation as to how these webinars came to be. I went through this on our Friday webinar with Dr. David Schwartz and Dr. Andrew Mouton, and uh, I'll abbreviate kind of what I said on, on Friday. You know, in this era of, of webinar overload, we, uh, we at Somnimed just started thinking about, can we bring something cool to the market um, that's different, that we haven't seen much of? And we kept getting back to the, the MD-DDS relationship and how important it is and how much we talk about it. Um, but there wasn't really any much in the way of content out there as, as to who is doing that well, what relationships are working and, and what can be learned. Can we, can we get some people on a broadcast and maybe give you guys an opportunity to, to snag a couple of uh, pearls and golden nuggets from these conversations? And but that soon became a conversation about there's other partnerships in the dental sleep practice that matter. It's not just the dentist physician relationship. And uh, there's some there's some practices out there that employ a full time sales rep, a full time field based sales rep that are responsible for driving physician referrals to the dentist. And Mike Ring, who we have tonight with us, is that person in Kent Smith's practice here in at Sleep Dallas. Um, and so uh, we, we, we built out a series of webinars. Right now they stand at six. Um, this Friday we're featuring Dr. John Viviano up in Ontario, along with uh, his uh, two big referring physicians, Dr. Howard Awad and his son, Michael Awad, next Wednesday. Ken Mogel was coming on with, uh, with Dr. Natalio Chediak. Um, and, uh, and then Brandon Hedgecock on May 29th with his full-time sales rep, uh, Sarah Morris will be joining us as well. We'll, we'll finish up the series uh, with Dr. Stacy Lehman uh, in Arizona and Lori Ledley, who's the founder and president of Valley Sleep Center. And those two have been referring back and forth for years. So um, we're bringing some really cool content for you guys. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. This is not meant to be commercial. Uh, you won't hear much talk in the way of specific devices of ours, but um, um, we're happy to uh, to provide the the awesome content. So, with that being said, welcome, Dr. Smith and Mike. How's how are we doing here in the uh, in 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 the world of uh, COVID nineteen? Yeah, it's going well. I mean, uh, we we never shut down, and I know that's not what you typically hear, but we decided during this time when everyone else was shutting down, we would uh, redouble our efforts. And, and uh, of course, Mike did have some problems with physicians being closed. <laughs> a, lot of them, a lot of them were shut down, but they're just starting to open up again. I mean, Mike, are you seeing a larger number starting to open up? Are they increasing their numbers? Uh, there's no question. Each, uh, just even from last week to this week, uh, the, the more offices are number one, they're open. Number two, they're open to having someone pop in. Uh, haven't had much luck getting to the back to visit with the nurses or doctors yet. Uh, but definitely the, the sensation out there right now is things are going to get back to normal. And they're going to get back to normal quick. That's good. I know Mike does send me a report every day and he reports the percentage of all these offices that are open. He asks, I guess you're asking somebody up front, how full are you or what, um, I guess, how busy are you? And most of them around 40 to 50%. Are you, I think Mike's frozen. Uh oh. Anyway, that's what he does. He gives us a daily report and all the offices he visited and the success he had who he talked to and then the percentage of business that they're seeing at that point and they they've been gradually increasing in the last report he's saying i haven't seen it today yet 
but it's I think 40 to 50 percent is about average for the physicians and and how many patients they're seeing so and then in our office we're right at about two-thirds busy compared to our full capacity back when we were um before COVID you know so we're climbing we're not there yet but but I think we're I'm happy with where we are right now I didn't expect to be this this far along and in fact, we just hired another sleep assistant today to help us meet the need because we're about to open up another operatory. Awesome. Uh, oh, Mike, I was just about to text you and tell you that you're frozen. Yeah, if it froze, freezes again, I'll just dial in on my phone and see if that helps. Okay, all right. The first question that I was gonna ask uh, was, was, was for you, Dr. Smith, and that is, you, you know, you've been running a very successful sleep practice for a dang long time. At what point, I, well, first of all, I imagine back in the day, you were getting out there, you were meeting with docs, you were, <laughs> you were bringing in pizza in order to get that FaceTime and all the things that we've done over the years, right? How, how did it all start for you? And then at what point did you decide, I need help? Well, you know, I, to be frank, I didn't have much success with it. And think part of it was because when I first started doing sleep it's been a long time ago but I was still doing a lot of dentistry I was busy I mean I just didn't have the time to get out and do it and the and the few times I did I kind of struck out and these sleep physicians didn't want to talk to me and I tell the story often I'm one of the ones that I went to originally she she said well y'all come on out I'll meet you in my office and I said, great, a sleep physician is going to meet me in my office, in her office. So I went out there, I sat down, and the first thing she said was, do you think Invisalign would fit this? <laughs> that was the reason she had me in. Wow. <laughs> so I didn't have much success. And uh, But you get somebody like Mike that's got the time, and he's not having to see patients all the time in the office and, and someone like that's got the time, it really works a whole lot better. Mike, tell us a little bit about your background because you come to this with oodles of experience in the sleep lab and the sleep world. Um, give us a, give the audience a little bit about who you are and, and how you got to, to this place. Oh, no. <laughs> He's frozen again. All right. Well, I can tell you a little bit about. It. <laughs> he's he's been at it about twenty years, uh, maybe even longer than that. He was in the the medical sleep world. He owned some sleep labs. Uh, he basically knew the ins and outs, and it was here in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. So he got to know everybody. Mm -hmm. He was well, with. Uh, yep. To him. Nope. He was. He was with, uh, actually worked for Simple Sleep for a while here. Right. And and was was a rep for okay. them. Um, but we stole him away. I've been away. in the medicine business now for about 20 years, but I've been in marketing and promotion for two years ago. my entire Two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. So I'm back. I'm trying to get going here on the phone at the same time. So sorry about that. We can, we can hear you now, Mike, but uh, if I were you, I would continue to try to dial in regardless. Yeah, get in on your phone. Yeah, he's been with me about two years now, and it's really been a fantastic experience. And anytime I will get a referral for, from a physician. Oh, is he there? We'll get a referral, and so I'll say, hey, Mike, I got a referral from so-and-so. It's, it's the first one I've ever gotten. Okay. So they go out. We'll do. So, yeah, about, about 20 years ago is when – this is really weird. Mike, if you can hear us, go ahead and dial in on your phone. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Smith, you were saying. Okay, so yeah, so it's it's really nice to have somebody that you just on a on a whim or a moment's notice can go see a doctor and report that all the things that we do, and that's what's hard for 
a doctor to do, someone like me trying to brag about myself, if you have a third party bragging about you, it works a lot better. It's a lot more believable. Mm -hmm. Now I know he's a, he, you know, he's a vendor. That's the way they see him. He's coming in trying to get business and you know, he's, he's gotten real good at that though. In fact, he'll, he probably wants to tell this story, but I'll tell it. Uh, the other day, you know, the COVID, they still weren't letting people in. So he went to the, he didn't know what they were letting him do and what they weren't. So we went into this big medical center and he said, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, to see the doctors. And, and I said, do you have an appointment? And he said, no, I don't have an appointment. And they said, well, we're sorry. We're not letting any vendors in. If you don't have an appointment, you can't come. So he said, okay. So we walked and went to another door, went in that door and someone said, uh, are, you, uh, are you here for an appointment? He said, yes, I am. I'm a patient. <laughs> And he got in and he got to, to meet some people. And so, you know, people like Mike, they know how to get around stuff. And, and that's been real handy for us anyway, because I'm, you may not be able to tell this, but I really am an introvert. I'm, I'm shy. I don't really like going out and, and meeting a bunch of people. And if you've got somebody that does, it's better at what you do or what, where you're not good, that mm -hmm. really works well. So, it's just like if you're married to somebody, you don't want to marry someone just like them. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. This is a marriage. And yeah. if we were just alike, it wouldn't work well. But he compliments what I can't do. You know, I can't say that he's the most organized guy. I'm organized. Um, but he's much more uh, capable of, of talking the talk. And he knows the medical sleep talk. That's what's really helpful. Right. Did you did you not have a Mike Ring type of person in that job before you hired Mike two years ago? No, I didn't. No. In fact, Mike came to me and said uh, he 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 came in our office just like he's going to other medical offices, and he said, "Hey, I was with Simple Sleep. Uh, I I know lots of people in the area. I can get you in some doors and." He sold himself to me and, and it worked. So that's the way I was confident. If he sold himself to me, he could probably sell me to the other doctors. And I am on the phone now, so. Mike, uh, Mike go ahead and hit your mute on your computer so that you, we, we're getting a little reverb because you're on, you're on kind of, you've got two active microphones. Well, you're asking me to do things that I just am not very good at. You, you can actually hang up. I mean, we won't be able to see you, but uh, if you want to, you can hang up on the on the webinar. Got it. Okay. Okay, Mike, can you hear me? Yep, I sure can. Okay, uh -huh. awesome. And you are you're coming through clear as a bell. So, um, technology, right? So, Mike, if yeah. you don't mind, can we just back up and and uh, you're you're unique. You're not Joe sales rep with a sales background, right? So, um, give us a little bit of uh, of your history, if you don't mind. So, just going back to the sleep stuff, I started about 20 years ago, and I just kind of fell into it with a friend of mine who owned part of a sleep lab, and we ended up working together there, and then we started our own sleep labs from there and uh, this was back around 2000 um, I did that for about seven eight years and so developed quite a relationship with a lot of physicians that were close to where actually dr. Smith is in Irving um, and then I got into the corporate world and did some sleep and DME stuff across the country um, and then uh, worked for Devilbus healthcare actually selling CPAP and respiratory equipment into the VA health systems for a few years until I started to, I got recruited by Simple Sleep Services about two and a half years ago to help try to build their physician relationship network. And they uh, they weren't in too good a shape when they brought me in. So I left there and, and I've heard Dr. Smith talk to tell the story of how I kind of got my way in with him. Um, but I mean, the thing about me is I've been doing this for 20 years and I know the sleep business really well. I know the sleep medicine side of it very well. Um, I don't know the, of course, when someone opens their mouth, I kind of get lost, but the actual science of sleep, AHI, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, the whole 
terminology and the science behind it, I know it really, really well. So when I get in front of a physician or a referral nurse, you know, I can speak the language of sleep. And I think that's a big advantage versus just somebody coming in uh, who's a pretty face that might, you know, know a little bit about sleep. I can actually talk to them about the differences, again, between oral appliances and CPAP and, and uh, you know, on down the road. And I, I think because I think that my age is actually an advantage at this point, which is kind of strange to say, but it really is because I think when I walk in, they go, oh, okay, here's an old guy, and he really knows what he's talking about. Maybe we should listen to him versus, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I could have walked in, and I would have had to bring in, you know, $300 worth of food to get anywhere. And I don't do that. I don't do any lunches. I, I'm a cookie guy. I think treats go just as far as lunches and uh, breakfasts, and, and, and they're more memorable. So I bring cookies, but not every time. A lot of times I don't bring anything. So Mike, let's get into your 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 selling strategy and and uh, kind of how you've been able to impact um, Sleep Dallas business in such a short time. So, and some of the some of these questions might seem a little obvious, but w what key practices do you hit up as as far as best referrals? Is it have you found is it ENT as a pulmonology family practice internal medicine where where are you having your biggest, getting your biggest bang for the buck? Well, I mean, we have a few pulmonologists that send us a lot of business, and, and they did before I came here, and they do, they continue to do so. Um, I, I think the bulk of the business really, and the, and the potential is just really in the family practitioner internal medicine uh, groups, because they see the largest volumes of, of people. And so um, I, that's kind of really where I concentrate, and then a few ENTs and a few pulmonologists. Which practices do you uh, uh, do you get the most pushback from? And why? well, I think the push the pushback comes from the guys who are board certified in sleep. Some get it that the oral, that the oral appliance is just an, as an effective tool. Um, some are just like no, oral appliances just treats just treat snoring, they don't treat sleep apnea, and I've been a CPAP guy my whole life and I'm not gonna change. And those, there's a few, and when we know a few well here in Dallas, that you're just not gonna change their minds. But there's so many others out there that you can change their minds, mm -hmm. I just move on. Yeah, I find it interesting that after Mike's visited some offices, we'll immediately get referrals from those, and they, they might not have sent me somebody in six months, but Mike, gets me top of mind again, right? Because they just don't think about it. And that's why you have to keep hitting them, keep hitting them. And and so that re repetitive stuff is really what works best. Uh, I think even well, with positions. And especially now, because now with the COVID-19, I mean, they are just doing the quick telemedicine and they're not even discussing sleep. So I'm having to just kind of re-educate, hey, are you talking about sleep with these people? And most of the physicians that I've seen in the last couple of weeks are like, I have not brought it up in a couple of months. So it's all about getting them to re-engaged in the, uh, in, in, in asking the sleep questions. So what's the typical cycle? Um, is, Mike, when you have what you think would be a, a productive meeting with a, with, a, with a prospect, how long does it normally take before referrals start rolling in? Um, and then I assume, like you said, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. It needs to be a regular thing thereafter in order to keep those referrals coming in, huh? Well, I, you know, it, it can happen as quickly as a few days. It just depends on whether or not they have a patient that walks through the door that they go, bing, here, there's a guy who needs, or a lady who needs, uh, me, who needs their sleep addressed. Um, so it can happen pretty quickly. As far as like the repetition, if you don't see these people at least once every, I would say month to two months, then you're then you're lost and forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so what I typically do is the is the more high volume people that send us patients, I try to see them every month, and then the tertiary guys, at least every couple of months. So what what do you what tools do you use? What, how do you make it? Uh, easy for those referrals to to happen. What do you arm them with? 
Well, we give them a referral uh, a referral form. That there's two basic forms. One is uh, is if a patient just simply needs everything, a sleep test and evaluation. And then the other one is if they've already had a sleep test and the doctor wants to try them on an oral appliance. So this could be a doctor that's pretty engaged in sleep and has been maybe scripting some CPAPs versus uh, from us from an HST or maybe does their own HSTs. Mm -hmm. um, then they use that other form. But really, it's just those two basic forms. And then we just have some general information about the practice, Dr. Smith. Um, and then what we try to do is every quarter or so, come up with some kind of little magic letter to stick in the packet or additionally add to the packet that has to do with um, oral appliances and sleep in general. Like uh, a couple months ago, we did one right before the COVID-19 thing hit. Um, the, the the big myths of the oral appliance. So it's just basically a one page letter from Dr. Smith discussing what are some of the larger myths about oral appliances and uh, and get that in front of physicians. So we try to do that at least once a quarter, some kind of new letter uh, about you know the advantages of an oral appliance. Dr. Smith, what do you think the what do you think the referring Doc's definition of success is when it comes to oral appliance therapy? I think uh, success would be the patient contacting them back saying, hey, thanks for sending me to Dr. Smith. I really appreciate that because they treated me so well and, and I love my appliance, right? That would be number one for me. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me about numbers, then I think it's all over the board. I think mostly physicians want it below five. They want it, want it to treat it just like CPAP. So there are some sleep physicians that we'll send them back for a follow-up study with the, with the physician. And if they do a study and the AHI went from 42 down to seven, they'll say, well, yep, they need to be on CPAP. And you're going, ugh. But in general, I think most physicians look at success being is the patient happy are they feeling good are their symptoms improved and that's what they should be looking at they shouldn't be looking at numbers all the time mm -hmm. and, I, and i would just add one other thing i think the other thing they look at is how quickly did we take care of the patient okay i sent the referral on monday was it three weeks before they actually got in to see anybody and I think that's one thing that we do really, really well. We get people in pretty quickly. We get their HSTs done fast, and we at least get the uh, the appliance in the process of being made very, very, very quickly. Where if they just send them out to a, a sleep lab, they may they may wait a month or two before they ever actually go in to be tested, and then who knows when they're going to get any, any therapy or when they're going to get evaluated for their therapy. Sure. Dr. Smith talking about that that sleep doc who you, you know you took their AHI all the way down to seven and it, you know that that's not considered a success or whatever it, it it brings me back to something I mentioned on Friday in our webinar with Dr. Schwartz and that's this new this new tool that that Sondamed came up with called the effectiveness equation and I see that we have a couple of attendees on this call that were on that rollout call a few weeks ago you were on that. Uh, and Mike, you have seen the effectiveness equation too. It's for those that don't know on this call, this the effectiveness equation is a high quality professional uh, tool to use with physicians to explain the, the the clinical proof behind oral appliance therapy relative to CPAP. And it, it's it's all about the fact that effectiveness equals efficacy times compliance. And this doc that you just kind of just described a little bit, uh, that efficacy might be there, but if it's only for four hours a night, then you, you know, you're, you, you've got an issue. Um, Mike, I just, I just walked you through the effectiveness equation um, last night in a, a little virtual meeting that you and I had. Um, what are your thoughts on that tool? Um, and do you think it's something that you can put in front of not only current referring docs, but prospective physicians and make some headway with it? Well, absolutely, because now you've got something you can show them versus something you're just telling them. I mean, I've been telling people for the last two years that the oral appliance is 
is just as effective as CPAP and in a lot of ways more effective for these for that very same reason you just stated that it's the people put it in their mouth and leave it in their mouth all night versus a CPAP that gets ripped off halfway through the night and a lot of times never gets put back on. Yeah. And so just from the standpoint of which one is used the most is is kind of defines which one is the best, you know, the most effective for therapy. And so now that it, 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 instead of me just telling physicians that, you, they can actually see it and we can show them the data and show them different models that show that. I, I think it's going to be very effective. Cool. cool. Dr. Smith, do you remember enough about that webinar we had about a month ago about the effectiveness of plays? It's a little fuzzy, but no, I do remember what it was about. Yeah. I can't give you any details, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we've known for a while. I mean, it, but it's, it is hard to communicate. And if you have a tool that lets us communicate it easier, that's a win-win. Agreed. Getting back to, getting back to those all-important referring docs, um, Mike, I'm wondering if part of your selling strategy is offering to get, an, uh, to get a device into the referring doctor's mouth. Yes, and we have definitely done that in a few cases, and I, I would say it's been very effective because if you have a, a, a physician who, you know, has some sleep apnea and he's been on a CPAP for the most part, and maybe a guy that doesn't even, that's never really believed in the effectiveness of an oral plants, you give him one and um, and boom, away you go. We've got one in Plano and for, and that I can think of right off the top of my head, Dr. Garduno, who hardly ever sent us anybody and since he's been using the Avant oddly enough uh, he's been a pretty good referral source right. yeah and that's a sleep physician too so I, that's where we've had most success I think with sleep physicians wearing these appliances something really interesting came up in the Friday webinar with uh, with Dr. Schwartz and Mouton and, and that's when Dr. Mouton uh, talked about the employees of their big practice, specifically the uh, the physician's assistants, the nurse practitioners, uh, and how critical they are to the entire referral process. Um, I'll even take it a bit further and, and talk about lab techs and and, uh, and and you know sleep center folks. Um, Mike, are you spending any time calling on 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 sleep labs and 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 spending any energy on these medical professionals that aren't necessarily MDs? Um, I mean, certainly I spent, spent a lot of time with, you know, um, nurse practitioners, PAs that are within the same offices that I see the regular doctors in. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time at specific sleep labs. They're typically owned by a sleep physician, so I spend my time with them. Um, and the lab managers at sleep labs generally don't have any control over what's going to happen with the therapy that it's usually directed by the physician. So I, I concentrate my efforts on the physician. Cool. Wondering if you've had any luck, question really for both of you. Have you had any success getting non-compliant CPAP patient referrals from any DME providers? Uh, no, we haven't. And that's been something that I know a lot of sleep dentists have been trying to do for the last 10, 15 years that we've been discussing this and we've just never had any success with it. I don't know, Mike, have you tried that at all? It seems like we haven't had success, but I don't know. Maybe I'm forgetting. Well, the only one I could think of that we've had any success is Dr. Kekar, because he gets it that some of his people aren't just not going to be successful on CPAP, and so he sends us those. But just your basic DME, no, we really haven't had this very, very much success from them, although we do keep trying, and I have some relationships with a few people, and they know we're out there, but we rarely, rarely get any get, get anything from them. Yeah, I think it's because they're not, they're a, they're a money business. They're there just to make money. Those DME companies typically are, you know, they're looking at bottom line and, and they're just not a good whiffum principle for them. They just don't see at all how they're going to benefit financially by sending the patient to us. Yeah. 
And I also think they think, well, the doctor's got to get involved anyway, so I'll just tell this guy to go back to his doctor and, and tell him to you know, refer him out to an oral plant. So we probably get a few coming that direction, but just directly from a DME company, no. Gotcha. Okay. Mike, let me ask you this. What's your, uh, what's your most outside-the-box marketing initiative that you've, uh, that you've implemented? I don't know. That's really a question for Dr. Smith. I've got a few, but maybe Dr. Smith would like for me to share which one he thinks is the best. Uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't prepared for that question. I have to go back and look at the numbers and figure out which was the most successful. But you're just talking about the strangest, um, weirdest thing that we've ever tried. I guess uh, that would be the school district thing. Yeah. Talk about the school district. That's that's the most unusual. Yeah. All right. So just real fast, um, I was sitting with the superintendent of the school district where my kids go to school a little over a year ago. We started talking about sleep um, and he was saying that he probably needed to be sleep tested. And, and, and we started talking about a lot of the teachers in the school district probably needed to be tested as well. And anyway, after a few meetings, he just he gave me permission to email directly to the teachers. He couldn't endorse it, but he said, I'm not going to tell them that it's not a good, it's not a bad idea if they ask. So basically he gave me the green light to email teachers, which is uh, something anyone can do. The teachers emails, sometimes you have to dig to find them, but they are public property. They belong to the taxpayer. And, and you simply put a message together to uh, get them to take, we have a we have a great quiz on our website where people can go on and, and get a quick snapshot of what their problems are so that we can call them and get them qualified with this quiz and get them get them called to get them to come in and so that's kind of what we lead with with an email to the teachers that hey we have this effective tool so snoring is a big problem and if you know a few other things to tease them into taking the quiz and then if they take the quiz we, we get them in and, and get them an HST and, and get them into an appliance. And so just by emailing a bunch of teachers, I don't know, we probably ended up getting 50 or so uh, patients that way last summer, maybe a little more than that, uh, that took really very, very little effort and zero dollars. Yeah, and then he got more superintendents and, you know, he's not telling you everything, but basically it sort of grew from there and it was really well. Fantastic. Um, yeah, you got to get permissions from certain people, and the superintendent's the place to start. Um, and once that, you know, once that happened, you can just kind of go, go, go. No doubt. Great job with that. Oh my gosh. Um, I want to. I want to just kind of address the audience real quick, uh, folks. Please uh, type into your into your chat box if you have a question for Dr. Smith or or Mike. Um, um, and our intent was that these uh, short, little, impactful webinars were about 40 minutes and were about 36. Um, Dr. Smith, Mike, let me ask you both a question. Um, the, the position paper of the AADSM uh, was all over, you know, all over social media last week. And, and I, for one, and I'm sure you're in agreement, I love, love seeing that. Yes. Um, how do you plan to use that statement uh, in your communication with with uh, with physicians out there, have you given it any thought? I've given it a little thought, yes, for sure. I've tried to figure out. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to, to hit anybody over the head with it. You have to be very careful how you present that, especially yeah. to sleep physicians. Um, I talked to a sleep physician in Florida, who says that she's at the university there. And they're told that they cannot turn on a CPAP in that hospital because of the ability of it spreading the virus. So they are forbidden to turn one on. Gosh. Yeah. And that's a sleep that's position. That's big news. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, I, 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 but I don't think they're talking about it, right? That was an institution and they're saying it. But I think either it's being ignored by the medical world um, but the, the actual statement, I'm still puzzled. I've sent it to my marketing people, um, my online marketing people, and I said, hey, 
how can we use this? We need to somehow put this out and, and get the word out. But I just really appreciate Dr. Schwartz for leading that group and, and getting that out there because it's it's a good message and I think it's got a short lifetime. It's not gonna it's not gonna be relevant for maybe another three or four months and then who knows. Yeah, it is fascinating. And and that and that's probably another letter that we come up with, Lewis, that we stick in the packets and I can take around personally and maybe there's some positions I can think of one lady off the top of my head that we just don't take the message to, but everybody else, absolutely. Well, and I had a patient today, as a matter of fact, a Medicare patient. He got his CPAP a couple of months ago, and then he started reading about stuff, and, and he, or maybe he figured things out. I don't know, because I didn't actually get to see him. My assistant saw him, um, and she was saying that he is now scared to wear his CPAP, and I think there's a lot of people out there. I think the word might be getting out, and or maybe they put two and two together and realize this is taking room air and it's it's spreading it out and and who knows i know that if you're living by yourself it's not a big deal but i i know that in i had a, had a fireman come in yesterday and he said he he was coming in because he didn't want to have his cpap there with all the other firemen i mean maybe that's another marketing effort is to fire fire uh, houses where everyone's sleeping together and and some of them have CPAPs. Hmm. Yeah, I see I see an I see a unique another unique opportunity for for us, you know, oral device manufacturers to collaborate on something on something that uh, that can you know benefit all of us. Um, it's a it's a very unique opportunity that this whole COVID-19 thing has has presented. Yeah. Uh, with paranoia about about CPAP, I think I think uh, the rubber is going to hit the road even more as patients. I hope this happens. Patients start going into their sleep docs and and doing what you said. The patient tells the sleep physician, "I'm concerned." Yeah. They they have to pay attention. To that, you know, we'll see what we'll see where it goes. Yeah, of course you'll have some sleep physicians that just say, "Well, I understand your concern, but those appliances don't work anyway." <laughs> gonna have some of that. that yeah. Equation. That's gonna fix it all. There you go. <laughs> all right. Um uh oh gosh, I'm I haven't looked over my questions. Let me let me try to catch up as best I can. Um so Dr. Uh Dr. Feigenbaum says, Do you ever tell MDs that oral appliances are suggested as first line? therapy during COVID-19. We kind of were just talking about this, but anything else to add about that? I personally haven't. I don't know if Mike has brought that up yet, but um, I don't know. I Mike. have to a select to a select few, yes. Okay. But with this new data, it's, uh, yeah, I think it makes sense to, to proclaim it to many more. And again, there's going to be a few that it's just pointless to do that with, and so I won't with those. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, Dr. Terry Riley, you type, how do I get that? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the effectiveness equation. Get in touch with your rep. Um, get in touch with Linda. She'll walk you right through it and, and let, you let you check it out. Um, Unless you're talking about the, the article from the ADSM, I'm not sure. Might be talking about that. Go to Facebook. Uh, go to the ADSM yeah. website. All over social media. Or drop me an email. I'll, I'll forward it along to you. Um, Okay, so this is a little bit of a, a tricky question, and, and I know there's sensitivities around compensation, but I do want to ask, and I'll ask this of you, Dr. Smith, how is Mike compensated? Uh, he does it for free. He's, he's really, he's a good guy. I really appreciate him. He's just a, giving back. He's, he wants to give back. He wants to, <laughs> he's got all the money he needs. No, that's a, yeah, that's something better not discussed on a public forum like this. I'm happy to respond to somebody privately and tell them because there's a few little things that are going on. Um, it's not, uh, and there's not one way to do that either. I, I've talked to some other doctors that have used people like Mike and, and everyone does a little differently. There's not one way to do it, but I'm happy to share if someone will email me. Um, my email, if, if someone doesn't have it, is info at sleepdallas.com. Uh, you can email me and I'm I'm happy. It just comes to me and I'll send you 
exactly what we do with Mike. If Mike and, get his permission. And, pick, and piggybacking on that, if you have heard an idea that you want to hear more about, you're welcome to email me, and it's mike at sleepdallas.com. Um, here's another good question. It's for you, Mike. It's a long question, but it's but it's 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 excellent. It's from Bria Woodson. Um, can you walk through a typical scenario of how you go into an office for a monthly visit, for example? You go to the front desk with cookies, ask to go talk to the doctors in the back, and then bring them a packet and have a conversation with them. Just curious what the typical protocol is. Well, the typical protocol would be pretty much exactly that. And and these are places that I it's pretty much an open door for me anyway. Um, so if I bring cookies in, they immediately let me go to the back. And so typically I may wait in the lunchroom for a little while for somebody to peek their head in. But once the word is there is out that I'm there, then the doctor usually finds a minute in between patients just to poke his head in. I tell him quickly what I'm there for something, whatever new that I need to talk to him about, maybe specifically about uh, like the letters that we sent in the packets, I might just show it to him and talk to him about it, like the myths of the oral appliances or maybe this new guideline about COVID-19, um, and, and then just wait in, in, in the back until I get around to talk to, to most of the physicians that are in that particular group, or at least the referral nurse or, um, or the medical assistant for that particular physician. So, you know, it's, it's a process. You have to establish some trust. Um, you have to establish some familiarity, uh, and that only happens by a lot of repetition. But then once you get that, the door usually is open, and sometimes you have to sit back there an hour before you get to talk to five different people. But sometimes an hour is well worth, you know, waiting. Yeah. Hey, I've got a question for Mike real quick. So, Mike, is the referral nurse the one that actually makes the decision on who you refer to, or does she take direction from the physician? Well, they're always going to take the direction from the physician, but if the referral nurse is someone that he trusts, then yeah, or she trusts, then, then they're going to let the referral nurse make the decision. Oh, great. Okay. I didn't, I never asked you that question. Let me ask one final question. It's an interesting question for you, Dr. Smith. It's really just your opinion on something. Dr. Uh, Rashmi Parmar out there in that Washington, D.C. area asks, do you think we're stepping over on toes or over toes on toes when we mention AADSM paper having a self-serving motive? Yeah, I think that's why I said I'm a little bit hesitant to do it. I, I think uh, probably most PCPs won't even know what the ADSM is. Mm. And so, Correct. yeah, they're not going to look at it as self-serving. Um, but anytime you have somebody that's going out and knocking on doors, it's going to look a little self-serving. I mean, that's why they do it, right? So I don't know that they would expect to see something that's totally objective. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would be concerned about shoving that in the face of a, of a sleep position. That would make me a little bit nervous. Mm. I, I would yeah. Yeah, I think it's a better piece for regular physicians than it is a sleep physician. Yeah, good point. Um, that's that's the that's the last question we had, guys. I uh, and we're right at that forty-five minute mark. We done good. I I can't thank you guys enough. Um, uh, I want to again invite everybody who's listening to join in on Friday at noon. Central Time, where we'll have Dr. John Viviano and Drs. Howard Awad and Michael Awad on to discuss that unique physician-dentist uh, relationship up there in the Ontario area. Um, Dr. Smith, thank you so, so much for your time. Happy to be here, yeah. And uh, so uh, Dr. Dr. Awad refers patients to us, too. Oh, he does? Different Awad. <laughs> A different Awad, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mike, thank you so, so much. Absolutely. Appreciate Sorry the video that. thing didn't work out too well. Oh, it's, uh, hey, we, we, it's, all, it's all good. Guys, on behalf of uh, the rest of my Somnomed team, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, joining in. Thank you for your time. Have a great dinner. Have a great rest of the day. And we hope to see you Friday on webinar number three. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>